All right. Hello, everybody. And I love, this is my favorite part, looking at the number of participants uh, tick up. And while you're getting yourselves in and settled, uh, I will give you a formal hello to my fellow Earthicans. Happy Blasphemy Day. It also happens to be uh, Orange T-shirt Day. Uh, but for some reason, the color orange has now and forever been ruined for me. Uh, but fear not, it is also International Love People Day. And I love that you are here for tonight's Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is, of course, a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord, and I am delighted to be your host. I am a stand-up comedian and author. Uh, I'm also co-host for the Point of Inquiry podcast. And uh, if you are, if you missed it, please check out the latest episode, Science Denial, Why It Happens, and What to Do About It. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, if you, uh, if you know I'm going to plug this, if you haven't already, please get yourself a subscription to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. The print subscription gives you access to the digital subscription. That's just more bang for your intellectual buck. So you can get either or both at skepticalinquirer.org. And please, by all means, mark your calendar for the next Skeptical Inquirer Presents. That will be on October 14th. And that's when we'll welcome Lee McIntyre, who will tell us how to talk to a science denier. That's right, folks. We have to reach across the aisle. If this week hasn't taught you that, we absolutely do. Now, uh, tonight is one of those special editions of Skeptical Inquirer Presents. We are having a conversation with the authors of Forces of Nature, the women who changed science. Um, women have been critical to the progress of science, but their importance has systematically been overlooked. Their stories lost, distorted, or even actively suppressed. Uh, but this book, Forces of Nature, sets the record straight and charts the fascinating history of women's discoveries in science. Uh, there have been many. Um, and I uh, encourage you to be a part of this discussion by sort of dropping your questions uh, in comments into the chat. I, I mean the Q&A. And uh, we'll get as many of them in as we can. And if you miss any of our convo tonight, uh, it is being recorded and will be available on skepticalinquirer.org. And so we are, we are really fortunate to have both authors with us tonight. Um, Anna Reeser is an American historian of science and technology. She holds a PhD in the history of science, technology, and medicine from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, she is the co-founder and co-editor in chief of Lighty Science Magazine, and her writing has appeared in The Atlantic, Real Life, and Star Trek.com. And as you guys know, as a Star Trek fan, I don't think it gets any better than that. <laughs> co author, co author, excuse me, Leela. Um, did I say that? No, it's Leela. Leela McNeil uh, is a writer, editor, and historian of science. Uh, she is an affiliate fellow in the history of science, at, also at the University of Oklahoma. Wow, how did Oklahoma get so lucky? Uh, she is also the co-founder and co-editor-in-chief of Lady Science magazine. And I don't know why I say Lady Science like it's British. I just It just feels so official. Um, <laughs> but she has been a columnist for Smithsonian.com and BBC Future. And she has been published by The Atlantic, amongst others. And so I welcome to my ready room, uh, Anna and Leela. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and thank you for writing this book. I will take myself off of speaker and put myself into gallery mode so I can see you and for the audience just in case if you don't already have this book this is beautiful I mean it is hard cover because this is hard science you guys it's <laughs> But it's a beautiful compendium. And I, uh, again, I want to thank you again for being here and for writing in. And I'm, I'd like to start with what this book is not, if I can, because it, it, you know, people, people see this and it's like, this is, this is serious. Um, but it's not an encyclopedia of women in science. So can you, can you describe the book for our, our watchers and listeners today? 
Absolutely. Um, so the book is really uh, offers an alternative to those very popular and I think also necessary books that are like 50 profiles of unsung women in science, um, those types of books that are really popular. Um, and instead of doing those types of biographies, the book is actually organized into chronologically into essays um, where we cover a specific time period theme topic that is important to understanding the history of women and gender in the history of science. And um, so we do mention specific women throughout these chapters and you will find kind of basic biographical information that you would need to learn more about them, like when they were born, where, that type of thing. But what we're really interested in, instead of covering a biography of every single one of these women, is placing them in their historical and cultural context so that we can understand more of how they contributed to the scientific kind of milieu of their time, like how they shaped the scientific world in which they were living and how that scientific world also shaped them as women. And um, that's really what we are interested in doing throughout this book. So for example, we, you know, we start in the ancient and um, medieval period and we talk about women's early activities for a way of evidence of them practicing as midwives and physicians and astronomers um, and cosmologists. And then we go forward and we talk about how women participated in science through a male relative or a husband when they were denied participating themselves as women. Um, and then we go all the way into kind of the modern age ending with um, a chapter on NASA and how women who even when they weren't allowed to be astronauts were really the ones you know, behind the scenes making sure that those space shuttles took off. You know, it, it's, it's funny, thank you for that sort of timeline I was going to ask you later, but I'll ask you now, you know, that that takes us to what I, um, one of my favorite films, Hidden Figures, which I will say, I, I've never felt so proud and so stupid. <laughs> At the same time, it's like, woo, I barely made it through my high school math and these children <laughs> completely amazing did you I, I don't want to put you on the spot but you didn't you don't have to have liked the film but do you think they got it right mostly um do you and do I will defer that question like that? to Anna since she is a okay. space historian okay <laughs> uh, I think the most important thing about the film version of Hidden Figures is how many people saw it and how many people love it um above and beyond like any kind of accuracy and that's not necessarily what we go to movies for right. it is accurate in that these are real people and they did these real things and like mm -hmm. obviously there are some things that are fictionalized for storytelling purposes but you know if the film is something that people enjoy they should read Margot Shetterly's book which is an excellent scholarly history of this if you want more detail but yeah um one of the reasons that we don't even really talk about it in the book is because um the impact of the book and the film was so overwhelming. And that's so incredible to me, like that they made such a huge splash. And mm -hmm. we kind of felt like this is a whole like other <laughs> category yeah. of thing that we, Margot is an amazing historian and we were just kind of like, show her do her thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the movie is fantastic my dad actually really loves that movie and he watch he like rewatches it all the time he's like I, I love just, that it's just so amazing yeah. I love that and I I, I love your your response to that because I think sometimes we go to the movies and we forget and we get a little nitpicky like wait a minute In, instead of letting that if you were if you were unfamiliar I think the more familiar you are the more picky you get but if you let go and realize most people don't have that same level of expertise and the right. best thing it can do is make you curious and go, I didn't know this. I right. want to know. More. Yeah. I think when we, Anna and I are very anti myth busting nitpicky about sci-fi <laughs> and history, historical okay. fiction, because that's just really not the point of it. Um, one of the things I will say that does get under my skin with these types of dramatizations of great men in science specifically, where they just conveniently leave out the wife or the female assistant that did their, a large chunk of their work. Oh yeah. That's yeah. when I get upset because that's the type of kind of cultural myth-making that contributes to overshadowing the type of women that we talk about in our book. 
Um, so yeah, that is that is one case in which Anna and I get pretty nitpicky about what's going on in you know historical nonfiction and dramatizations of and biopics and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I never I see that stuff. I'm like, wow, look at all those diapers you guys aren't changing. <laughs> Look at and that dinners. huge house you're not cleaning. Yeah, yeah, and those dinners you aren't making. Like, like the emotional <laughs> labor of the house helped contribute to what you're doing. And I don't know, I think pillow talk counts. You're going to talk that idea out with somebody, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh my gosh, I'm loving this. I'm loving this. I want to ask you, um, who is this book for? Who did you intend it to be for? And who do you hope it'll, it will pick this book up? So this is something that I used to kind of joke about in the early process of this book. And I think it was because I was being a little bit self-deprecating um, because it was originally going to be an illustrated book as opposed to having photographs. And I used to say like, oh, well, you'll be able to find it in the bargain bin at Barnes and Noble. And anyone <laughs> who you know that like science, you can just get it for, for Christmas when you're like behind on your shopping. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that's exactly where I want this book to be. And that's exactly who I want to find it. Um, it's an alternative to the other things that you might find about women in science. Um, it has a really extensive bibliography and kind of lots of opportunities to um, instigate kind of further exploration if this is something that you're interested in. And you know, this discussion can't just happen in academia and as somebody who's still kind of enmeshed in that world it's not even really happening there <laughs> so like for me I want I want this book to speak to uh, people like my mom or my younger cousins um, people who order it for their grandkids who are interested in science um, we you know in strategic terms we talk about just like a general reader, a general audience, things like this. But I think I have, you know, very specific ideas about who I want to read this. And I've been really lucky that like my family has read it and they would never read something like this. Um, right. Otherwise, I think so. It's nice to to think about, um, you know, the, the bargain bin as kind of a metaphor for like an encounter that anybody could have with this book. And I think you can. It's definitely not a super academic home. Um, we tried to make the writing as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and it's each of the individual stories kind of stands alone in a way that you can kind of flip through it and just read something, read a kind of complete story about um, one woman or a group of women and get a picture of like a little slice of history. And that's kind of like a nice thing. Yeah. Like and that. I'll add also that in addition to what Anna said is that I I really do hope that people who are practicing scientists right now will read it and not just aspiring women in science. I want people okay. who are in the institution and in the culture right now to read that and look back on the past of their field that they've chosen to look at those historical roots of systemic oppressions that have kept women out, people of color out, um, people with disabilities, so that they can see how those are still mirrored in the system that they're enmeshed in today, um, so that they can start to understand the work that needs to be done, or at least become aware of how of those historical roots shaped the thing that they were a part of and what they can start doing to kind of unshape it and shape it into something better. Thank you. Thank you both. You both, you both said things I want to, want to pick up on. Um, <laughs> no, no, seriously. I mean, the, Anna, you, you, you just sort of casually dropped that uh, these conversations uh, are not even happening as much as they should be in academia. Why not? Why are, why are we, why is this still happening? I mean, I guess it's the arrogance of the present. We always want to think we're better. We're the best humans ever, the best version of ourselves. And we, we probably aren't. You know, so why is that conversation not happening? And is it because um, maybe more men need to read this book too, <laughs> perhaps? If we tell them it's a bathroom reader, 
Yeah. Do we need to put some military history in there? Good boy. Oh. Oh. I mean, oh yeah, my gosh. Put it on your toilet tank. I don't care. Oh no, my just gosh. Take, put this in there and put, you know, cover over, paper over the cover that's on there and put the Karma Putra on there and make it your bathroom. <laughs> I'm not above a little love, little trickery and deception <laughs> to, to get this done. Um, it, I, 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 I like that. I like that. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I hate to, oh, please. No, just an answer to your question. Um, I think that uh, women's history um, and particularly women's history of science is still seen as just like a niche. Um, typically when we teach uh, the history of science, which is my, our field, and I'm still teaching. Um, you'll teach like an intro class that um, covers your, your Plato, your Aristotle, Galen, uh, up through Galileo, Copernicus. The maybe. greatest hits of the Western men's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you'll do, and then you'll do a week on, on women and gender, just a unit on women and gender as like a separate subject. And with this book, we wanted to kind of make a really strong statement against that. Um, one of the things that is really important to me is that I know that people are using this as a textbook in Intro to History of Science classes and teaching that history of science from this perspective. Because if you can teach it from the perspective of all the dudes who are doing it, there's no reason you can't teach it from the perspective of all the women who are doing it. Um, so in academia, at least, like there is still siloing of women and gender studies as like a niche, you know, area studies kind of interest or something you can get like an extra certificate in. And that's not to demean the like incredible foundational work that we relied on to write this mm -hmm. book in the first place. There are many women historians of science starting in the 1970s and even earlier who were making a very concerted effort to recover these histories and to incorporate them into this kind of larger canon of the history of science. And, you know, without them, this is not possible. None, basically none of the things that Layla and I work on together would be possible. Um, but, you know, I've spoken to some of these women historians and they basically said, I, well, it's cool what you guys are doing, but I wish you didn't have to still do it this way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wish you weren't always up here defending what it is you're doing. So. There is definitely like a, a, a still a lack and um, in terms of like who this book is for, um, for me, it's for students and I've taught with it as well. And it's for students um, to get a different perspective on the history of science and particularly at that moment when they're being introduced to the history of science, that they're not being retold this kind of old moldy story about um, all these old moldy dudes. Yeah. Well, and I, I just want to add on to what Anna said as well. Like she mentioned the wonderful women historians that we've based our work on and not that there aren't great men that are doing the historical work as well, but the onus is still on women historians to be doing this work and we can't carry it all the way. Like it, there has to be more male historians engaged in this work, just like there needs to be more white historians engaged in um, the recovery of African American stories, like we still like you, it can't keep be being relied on the marginal, the historically marginalized group to recover their own stories. It has to be a buy-in from the entire community, and that mm -hmm. includes the ones who have been in power and have had the power of writing our histories since we began writing histories. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, Layla, it was you who mentioned that, you know, like history is all military history. And there's this great site that I would hang out on. I used to get their email every day called On This Day. Um, and it, 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 I was surprised at how much war there is, war and military and strategy. I'm like, did anybody do anything else ever? <laughs> like, where are the women? And it, 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 I would like to think what's changed now between the wonderful historians that you were talking about and, and that the work that you've built on, um, that today that at least people are asking the question. I, I hope they're looking and going, wow, we have 10 white male scientists. Hang on. 
Do you know what I mean? To at least get them to question that. Like there's got to be somebody else in the room or on this list. Um, right. And if we can move the needle at least that way, which I think you guys are doing in, in terms of what you're carrying from what was, you know, done before. Because you're right, we, you, you can't do it all by yourselves. We cannot do it all by ourselves. There's got to be complete uh, buy-in from others. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, this may be a self-serving question, uh, maybe a gimme, uh, but why? Why are women's experiences and knowledge so important <laughs> to, you know, the history of scientific inquiry, as it were? Like, why? Like, because I'm sure some guys sitting around going, hey, the men have done it. We've done just fine. <laughs> yeah, you haven't, but okay. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of issues, you know, <laughs> leaving it up to the men, I suppose, at, you know, certain points in history. Um, but one of the things that we um, really try to suss out in the book um, is that when you have a homogenous group of people investigating nature, investigating the human body, investigating the human mind, they're going to kind of come to the same conclusions that they want to find. Um, and it, it shouldn't be a stretch to understand that science is not some unadulterated body of knowledge that's just living out there, that it is something that is done by people and created by people and people participate in it every day. Mm. Um, and so when you have a homogenous group of like we have for the majority of history, straight white men, you know, coming up about theories about the human body, theories about nature, that it's a homogenous experience informing their questions. When you have, when you diversify that group, when you have women bringing the experiences that they have, their lived experiences, their specific knowledges to investigative questions, it has the power to shape scientific knowledge itself. And um, that can be, you know, that can, that stretches not just to women, but, you know, um, people of color. And I mean, when we think about the history of scientific racism, the people who created scientific racism were white men, right? You know, if it had- Yeah, been, yeah, I'm not claiming that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do it. I mean, and it, and it was, I mean, we look at the 19th century when scientific racism was really born that, you know, we can, if we go through the list of the people who created ideas about eugenics and inferior races through anthropology and ethnography, that, you know, it is a greatest hits of white men with really weird beards and, and, and sideburns, it's insane. And so you had a homogenous group of people making decisions and declarations about the biological nature of most of the rest of the planet based on their skin color. And that created a whole science that we're still dealing with and trying to get yeah. out of our scientific institutions today. So that's yeah. what, that's why it's important to have diverse experiences, diverse people into science, not just to get your numbers up and to get role models and be like, look, if there's more role models of women, more women are going to want to do it. That's not the case, <laughs> you know? And, and that's also not the point. It has to be to diversify scientific knowledge itself because we live in a scientific world. And if we want science to, and medical science and technology to be for everybody, everybody has to be included in its creation. Uh, I think those examples that you gave of men with weird, weird beards, <laughs> you know, we, we forget, you know, yes, it's science, um, but people are, they, they are products of their time and products of their biases, you know, which we still have today. And, you know, the more people that you have sort of breaking that homogeny and asking those questions that sort of break you out of that mindset, yep. the better we do, Yep. you know, in, in my opinion, in yeah. my opinion, um, I, I, I don't think I'm wrong on that. Um, I have I, several more questions here for you guys. Um, is it possible that, and I, I'm being, I'm erring on the side of being very kind. Um, is it possible that women were sort of overlooked um, historically because what they were doing wasn't seen as science? You know, like they, 
Do you know what I mean? Like they did. Yep. Like, oh, they're just birthing babies. That's not science. <laughs> That's not hard work. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. You know, um, were they I calling it something different? Yeah, I think we find that the case um, in a lot of places. And and to just say up top, a lot of times, the only reason that things aren't considered science because women do them is because men say that they're not science because women mm. do them. Mm. Um, but we see, I mean, your example of birthing babies, um, the entire like profession of obstetrics was basically co-opted by men from the like centuries of knowledge that women have about delivering their own babies and delivering babies in their community, acting as midwives um, in a formal sense, like in Rome, being a midwife was a job. It was a recognized kind of profession you could have. There were kind of rules about what it was to be a good midwife. But also mm -hmm. like in communities, women would be expected to have possess that knowledge anyway, that you would of course help your mother or your sister or your aunts to give birth or whatever. Um, but basically, you know, we have this situation in the 19th century where obstetrics is basically uh, turned into a science and then all the women and midwives are kind of booted out of it. Um, so then midwifery wow. isn't a science, obstetrics is a science. We would call it a different name now. Uh, we introduce some like instrumentality and some tools and some forceps um, and do a whole bunch of other stuff that is very unsavory. Um, and then we just boot women to the side. Thank you for all of your help understanding how uteruses work, but we're good now. We've got it <laughs> under control. Yeah, they, they don't, they don't got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we, find wow. that, we find that a lot. And it's also, it's not just, um, you know, I think the obstetrics thing is one, one of those stories that is getting more traction. And I think that more people kind of know about but there are just other things that we don't often talk about, like domestic engineering as the way that women in as as Western societies are industrializing, they're being asked to incorporate science and technology into their management of the home. They're being asked mm. to understand things like scientific management, to understand things like uh, food safety and germ theory and like hygiene theories. And they're being asked to implement those in their own homes. And there are a lot of women in this period who uh, turn that into like a full-time job. They establish like experimental stations in their own home where they do all of this research on what is the best way, what is the most efficient way to lay out your kitchen so that you can save time and motion. Uh, what is the best way to like prepare and preserve foods to keep your family healthy and safe. Um, so women are, are being, are being encouraged in this period to like bring all of this science into their homes. And it's almost like as soon as it comes into their house, then it's just house homemaking, you know? And so we don't spend a lot of time thinking about that. But then at this period, like universities in the United States are established in home economics departments. Like it is becoming a thing that you can pursue in a formalized way. So mm, yeah. it's strange that we don't spend a lot of time on these things that are are actually institutionalized. And then when you look at things that were never institutionalized, um, like the way that women know how to make laundry soap in you know, the depression or the way that women in the 18th century created all kinds of home cures and uh, various kinds of unguents and potions for themselves, for their families, for their communities, they made medicine. Those things never became institutionalized um, they were community practices and practices that women did in, in the context of care work that they were already expected to undertake. So kind of tracing those activities and understanding the kind of systemic understanding and like knowledge about nature that it takes to do these things, there's no reason we can't call them science. It's just that we never did. And we wow. don't call anything a science is because we decided to call it a science, you know, we invented all of this stuff. So there are social yeah. and cultural reasons that we don't call these things science. And those things are worth interrogating. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sitting here with my mind blown at, <laughs> at what, no, really, you know, we, we've found so many ways to sort of undervalue women's work, quote unquote, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm thinking of my, uh, my grandmother and my mom would tell me stories how my grandmother made 
um, starch on the stove because Saturday was laundry day. And I'm like, what's starch? <laughs> like, right, what right. are you talking about? You know, but it was, it, it, it's women's work was, was hard work, you know, and in terms of home remedies, yeah, that's who made you feel better. If you wanted to still feel sick, you call daddy. You want to feel better? You call mommy. Mommy <laughs> figured it out, right. you know? Right. Um, no disrespect to daddies in the audience, but yes, <laughs> we, we haven't, you know, they're, yeah. you, oh, I'm just, thank you for saying those words. Yeah. Like, I, yes. It's, I, that's really amazing. Um, to that point, to that point, um, we, I think we sort of, if you're not in the field, uh, you, you learn, or you hear about like the, the big names, the you know, women's big names in science, you hear about Marie Curie, and um Marie Curie and um <laughs> Marie Curie <laughs> it's like like okay we've got her like she's always an answer for a jeopardy question um but there are you there's way more who's as as that fill your book so can I can I throw a couple of names out at you because there might be some folks who don't have your book yet and might want to hear um yeah. a couple of stories and I will I will tell you uh one that that stood out to me um Mamie Phipps Clark yeah who's that so Mamie flip fl flips flips I like that <laughs> sweet flips yes yes this is the post happy hour version of this show <laughs> uh, Mamie Phipps Clark was a psychologist trained at Columbia University and she um actually became the first black woman to graduate with a PhD in psychology from Columbia and um, her, her work is interesting because she was kind of coming out of this period where scientific racism in the field had really reigned supreme since the 19th century. Yeah. And she comes in a Black woman from the segregated South, um, and she wants to dedicate her work into understanding the psychology of racial identity and specifically racial identity in children. And um, she starts to investigate like, so at what age do black children start to understand that they are black? And what does that mean? How does, how do they, you know, um, bring that into themselves? And so one of the things that she found was that children who, um, black children who went to segregated schools versus integrated schools knew earlier that they were black but they had also internalized negative stereotypes about, about Black children into themselves. Um, and uh, that they had preferred if they had straighter hair or lighter skin, um, those types of things. So her, her study found that you know, school segregation has a profound negative influence on Black children. And later on down the line, after she did that research, um, her study called the doll test and you can still google it and find people doing the doll test today um, wow. to see how much not things have changed since she was doing this during um, the civil rights era um, and um, her case her study was actually used in brown versus board of education which as we know was the supreme court case that threw down school segregation. Um, and that was the very first time that a social science had been used in a Supreme Court case as evidence. Um, and she was extraordinary. She Even after all this, she had a hard time getting a job as a Black woman in psychology. Um, she ended up starting up her own institution in Harlem, um, where she provided um, psychological services to um, the Black children in Harlem. And it is still there today. And it was the first and only institution in that area that offered those types of services to Black children. So she was an extraordinary woman. Wow. I, you know, I just feel you, you put it in today's terms. She would have a TED talk, her <laughs> YouTube channel, you know, she would be working. Oh my goodness. Yep. It have been such a hard time. Um, I, I have to tell you who made me laugh and I want you to, I wish either one of you to share uh, her story. Uh, Hildegard of, am I pronounced Biggin? Biggin? Biggin, yeah, Von Biggin. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, way to work the system, girl, but can you share <laughs> Like, I love it. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Otherworldly. Please share uh, her story. <laughs> 
Um, Anna, do you want to do this one or do you want me to do this? Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's all you. That's all you. So uh, Hildegard, um, I think a lot of people might have heard of her at some point. Um, she was an abbess um, in um, the Middle Ages in Germany. And um, she was basically a polymath. She composed her own music. She was a mathematician. She wrote natural science books. She wrote medical compendiums, um, kind of going back to women helping women. She did this for the nuns to care for the other nuns and to midwife oh. in the community that they're, okay. um, I always want to call it a coven. It's not a coven, convent. <laughs> <laughs> Those are different things. Very different Her convent things. Served, <laughs> not coven. Um, uh, and the want um, of a letter. She um she claimed that she was a mystic, and in Christian tradition, mystics receive um, divine visions from God, and um, she was the first verified um, woman mystic. And so she was walking a really fine line with this. Like it was all, already unheard of that a woman would rise to power in the church and speak out. Um, and the things that she was speaking out about was basically the nature of the cosmos, um, which up to this time had been basically just observed and published by men. And her, she claimed that she received her vision of the cosmos through divine intervention with God. Um, and that that was really the only way that her cosmology could be accepted. And she did write them. She had um, uh, her, um, I guess, assistant write them down. They are beautiful. They called the skivias. You can um, Google them. They are beautifully uh, illuminated. Um, but she also had a very unique vision of the cosmos, which was very much looks like a vagina on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> you know, I've been thinking looks, about getting a tattoo. It might be that. It might be. I mean, and it looks just like this. Um, and it's uh, basically a, an egg or vulva on fire. And it is a very feminine understanding of the nature of the universe. Um, and uh, it goes back to the idea of nurturing. And that was, as a woman, her experience bringing her vision to, of the cosmos to the public. And the only way that it could be accepted was if she yeah. could claim that it was through divine intervention with God. And um, she really nursed that. <laughs> I bet all it was we're like taking when she wanted to get something from like the pope or something like that then she would like and he was like nah she would claim that she was like stricken down ill um by you know her mysticism with god um and that she once she was given what she wanted she would just rise from her bed and <laughs> now I get to build a new convent across the river and like all sorts of stuff but like whatever way that you look at it um it seems very much aware in her in the historical work on her and in her writing herself she's very aware of the fine line she is walking as a woman claiming mm. to speak for God and she constantly has to reinforce and bring to the fore that these are not my visions of the cosmos, these are God's, um, which is not something that a man at that time would have to claim in order to propose a vision of the cosmos. Um, you know, so yeah, no, she is an incredibly interesting character. Um, <laughs> you know, in my in my head, I kind of saw it almost as a Saturday Night Live sketch where they yeah. go, you know, hey, where'd you get all these ideas? Well, I did some reading. I put in some research. I did the work. And everybody's like, mm. she goes, OK, fine. God told me. Yay. Because <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so stupid, but OK. Yeah. And um, I mean, we also we often hear a lot of stories about, you know, male cosmologists against the church and, you know, having to go against the inquisition with what they believe about the church or whatever. Well, here we have a woman who is in the church using the church to progress her it. ideas about the cosmos. And this was at a time when witch burnings were happening in Europe. Right. So, you know, she's taking a big risk. So when we talk about male martyrs for science and 
whatever. I mean, here we've got Hildegard in the heart of the church, (laughs) you know, during this really bad time for, for women who, you know, have suspicious knowledge about the universe. So I just think that her, her story is really important when we talk about the history of cosmology to include. Oh my gosh, absolutely. No, it, it, it completely tickled me, but put in its time, it's not funny. This is serious, you know, you know, she's, she's, you know, honestly trying to save her own life in, in, in some ways, honestly. Um, I, I hope you don't mind. I do want to get to some questions that we have here, but this is, this is very selfish of me, um, to sort of take a bit of a pop culture turn. We went there a little bit with hidden figures, but does, um, does, do you think the fictional representation of women in science matters you know because there are tv shows like big bang theory um star trek we're not counting original series because the representation of women in science in the original series is abysmal mr roddenberry how could you how could you you know or, or even in the movie black panther you know the um the the scientific mastermind you know, of Wakanda was Shuri, you know, T'Challa's sister. Like she looked like she's 12 years old and knew everything, you know, like, and again, it's fiction, but do you guys think that sort of thing is important um, to be seen? I do think it's important. And I think it's more important than um, a sort of baseline, like we need women role models and STEM kind of reading of it. Um, going back to what Layla was saying about how um, we live in a scientific world and if we all want to benefit from from that then everybody has to be represented and involved in the science that shapes our world I think being able to see that in media is part of making that happen Um, part of having people understand that science first of all isn't done by like a lone genius alone in a lab Um, I think stuff like Star Trek is great for that. Like it takes a team to get stuff done. You can't go on a way mission by yourself. Um, (laughs) That's called vacation. (laughs) (laughs) What? Um, And just uh, changing the way that we understand science at a pop cultural level, at a like trope level. Like what are the tropes of, of science? that we see in media. And I think we've come a long way from like, you know, when I first started grad school, we were talking about how we would have students do the like, draw a scientist um, kind of exercise and everybody would always draw a man. I don't think that that's necessarily happening anymore. Um, I think the kids are okay uh, in that respect. (laughs) And I think part of that is the like, the huge influx of like media representation that we have that like, Science is something that is done by everybody. It's done by teams and it's done by people who don't, who don't look like that stereotypical image of a scientist so much so that I don't even think that's a stereotype for, for young people now. I mean, we have women astronauts, we have women Mm -hmm. space tourists. I mean, they're like, I think that it's a huge, a huge improvement and it is important. And I, I'm hoping we don't lose ground because ground can be lost as we, mm-hmm. as we see. Um, so I, I, I do hope that continues. I was, I was trying to find this on my phone because I read um, uh, a piece that you wrote um, for Star Trek.com and I was really touched by that last line. It sort of sums up what you were just saying about how we can, we can have advancement if we are advancing everyone. And I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm paraphrasing that probably badly, but it was like, yeah, no, we, we, we can do that, but can we do it for everybody? And I thought, yes, yes, that it in a nutshell. Thanks, everybody. Good night. <laughs> you know, great stuff. Um, so thank you. Thank you um, for that. I want to uh, get to some of these questions that folks have. Um, thankfully, not uh, thank you for, for sending this in. Oh, in Maryland, yes, this goes exactly to what we were talking about earlier. Um, what is actually known about the contribu- contributions of Mrs. Albert Einstein? Like, we don't even know her name. We're Mrs. Albert Einstein, like it's the 60s. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. We actually don't cover her much in the book. Uh, actually, I don't think we cover her in the wives chapter, um, but um, it's, 
one of the, we did a podcast episode on her with um, our magazine, Lady Science, a while ago, but people are really still just trying to understand what her contributions were. Um, what we do know is that she was incredibly brilliant. Um, she was, seemed to be doing better in school than Albert. Um, she, I love it. <laughs> yeah, um, was eventually, um, dragged down with household stuff and children. <sighs> and she, um, what, from what we understand, she did help him quite a bit with his schoolwork. Um, what we know about how she contributed to E equals MC squared, we're not, sure but one of the things i think to understand and i think you know in our wives chapter something we really try to get to the heart of is because these women lived with these men they their homes at that time typically were their laboratories and where they did their research and so it's hard to separate out his work from her work because they were working together all of the time so to be able to say, well, he did this and she did this, it's just not possible because their lives and their work were so intertwined that you can't really quantify it that way. Um, but what we can say for certain is that she contributed largely to his work um, and that he was frankly very unkind to her when it came to her wanting recognition and credit. Um, and there is a new biography, I believe, of her, and I can't remember, we do talk about it in that episode that Anna linked to, um, but that kind of goes into their, their correspondence with each other and kind of how, you know, he kind of threatened her in the sense of like, well, no one's going to believe you because you're a woman and I'm me. Um, and so, <laughs> I mean, yeah, wow. I mean, and they wrote it down. It's not like we're making this up. He wrote it down, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we have record of it. Um, but yeah, I think that's just something to think about when thinking about any, how much did this wife contribute is that it's really, really hard to say just because they live together, they work together, their collaboration was so tied together that it's hard to pull those apart. Mm. And just um, in case you guys, if you're, you're listening and you haven't noticed, uh, um, we've actually dropped into the chat that episode, um, the wives of uh, helpers of wives, sisters, helpers of science. So if you want to give that um, a listen, uh, Gabrielle uh, is asking, why do European and Eastern countries have so many more women in science? Is that even true? I don't, do this one. I don't think it's true. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think it's a representation issue, yes. not an actual who's participating issue. Yes. And I think um, I'll just say in terms of our book, we did try to include as many non-Western women as we could. We are limited by our, my frankly, mediocre language skills. <laughs> uh, Mine too. <laughs> yeah. And just being able to um, access records and trying to write about the entire history of, you know, from the ancient time to the present. But I don't think that's true. I think that we just know about more women from Western Europe. Um, and that's just a matter, there are like, you know, you can get into the weeds with some historical stuff about the importance of say, like the printing press in the Islamic empire versus how in Northern and Western Europe in certain periods of time. Um, but I don't, I think that what we perceive as a difference there is an artifact of record keeping, an artifact of who's being studied at all, an artifact of who has the resources to do this kind of work. Back to what Layla was saying about asking marginalized people to recover their own history. Um, you know, we are we just expecting people who live in places where they don't have access to you know, running water to like do our history work for us. And like, mm -hmm. I just think it's a, it's a, an artifact of, of our representational structures and the way we do history and the, like the engine of Western history as a whole that we don't, that it appears that way. And I do not think it's true. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Cause it, when I asked the question, I'm like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> But you, you can't go on that assumption. And thank you for, for saying that. 
Um, Robert wants to know, are there gender differences in how men and women approach science in general? Um, I approach it with a fly swatter, Robert. I'm not sure if that's what you meant. <laughs> I approach mine with a diaphragm. Uh, there we go. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um... <laughs> I'm not. No, I'm <laughs> um, I think that part of the answer is, is yes. Um, and I think it also depends on what science you're talking about as well. Okay. Um, but so I'll give an example from the book. So um, there's a chapter that we have on psychology and its emergence as a cohesive field in the 20th century. And, um, you know, at, at, at the beginning, it was largely, again, white men with beards and sideburns. And um, they, the ideas that they had about called the psychology of women or the psychology of women um, was largely based on kind of these Victorian gender roles about, you know, well, women stay in the house all the time because they really want to. It's like built into their psychology <sighs> that this is what they want. And so the reason why, you know, even if we did allow them to go to school and to have jobs and be lady bosses or whatever, is that, you know, we'd really be depriving them of their natural instinct to be yeah. mothers yeah, and wives. Sure. Yeah. And so in when we get more and more women into the 20th century coming into higher education, um, and they're saying, actually, no, <laughs> that's not how I feel. Like, that is not what I think. That is not my experience. That is not my lived experience as a woman. Please stop telling me, you know, Mr. Scientist, what my experience and my psychology of a woman is. And so when you have women coming up into the field, and especially more during um, the civil rights movement, things like Title IX and all of that, um, you know, the, we get the evolution of the psychology of women to feminist psychology really emerging. And they start to ask questions that men were not asking because they aren't women. They don't know what to ask about women other than projecting their own ideas and fantasies of what they want women to be. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes when we look at like the psychology of race during that period. And then you get more and more people of color entering psychology that are saying, actually, no, black people aren't inherently less than we don't we're not inherently less intelligent what are you talking about and so in those cases like we do have examples of where the knowledge and experience of marginalized people does matter that their specific ex lived experience as a marginalized person changes the way the science works mm, okay okay and that for some reason is threatening Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and of course that's threatening because if going back to that example, you know, if we strike down the idea that women are inherently, you know, wanting to be at home all the time and inherently, they aren't inherently less than and they're not inherently inferior, that's, you're losing control of that group of people that you have historically had control over. <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. And why are we trying to control human beings? That's a very, yeah. uh, well, and I think that that's very much a conversation that this book engages in is how science has operated as a tool for power um, over certain groups of people. And, you know, this book engages in that, uh, that conversation. And I think that's a conversation that is very much worth having, and, you know, and, and will be ongoing for quite some time. You know, it reminds me of something I, I heard uh, earlier today that people um, about conflict, you can either see if you see conflict as a fight, uh, you see it as a fight, a problem or a lesson. You know, and we, we generally see it, we're, we're, we're a very combative culture as opposed to if we see it as a lesson, what can we learn from our differences? Right. Um, instead of trying to control folks. Um, Shree Greenwood um, asked the question, and uh, they would like to hear your take on Dr. Jocelyn Bell Burnell. I'm, and I apologize, I don't know who that is. Um, but she apparently should have received or at least shared the Nobel Prize. But that, that's actually an issue that you guys talk about, that women have not 
really gotten their due from the Nobel Committee. Do you know who Dr. Jocelyn Bell is? Yeah, and I am, and I'm showing my ignorance. I'm so sorry. No, it's all right. <laughs> Jocelyn Bell Burnell is an Irish astrophysicist, and she is responsible for the discovery of pulsars, um, which is a very important astronomical cosmological discovery. Um, and she did that when she was a graduate student. And um, my take on um, whether or not she should have shared that prize with her advisor, I have to defer to her because she's talked about it. She's still alive. Um, she doesn't really feel slighted by that. Um, her kind of take on it is that um, in the time and place where she was working, um, in the sort of like culture of of British academia, uh, it would not have been appropriate for her to receive credit for something that she did as a grad student. And obviously I have feelings about that, but she like, she understands it as like a consequence of that structure and that she's not really that pressed about it because she has received uh, many other awards and a lot of recognition since then. Um, okay. But it's an interesting case and it is one that we talk about in the book about um, about the Nobel Prize as just like often the way that um, people who may not be like participating in science or even interested in science still come to know about um, these figures in science, you know, when the Nobel nominations come out every year and like that's obviously a good thing to win a Nobel Prize. Everybody knows what that is. Um, but we talk also about the way that um, looking at the field through the Nobel kind of distorts um, what's actually going on. Um, and it kind of oversimplifies things. I mean, obviously women are massively underrepresented um, among Nobel prizes in the sciences, um, particularly in like physics and chemistry. Um, but if you were to take like the aggregate numbers, all scientists are underrepresented in the Nobels, right? Because they're very exclusive and very limited. And so it's just a very narrow way to look at the field and looking only, trying to find women where in spaces that are kind of designed for and catered to men is not a good way to kind of find women in the history of science. It's not a good way to, mm -hmm. to approach recovering those stories because the fact of the matter is that you often will not find women in spaces that are designed for men, that are, that are catered to men, institutions that are run by men, you just often will not find them there. And so looking outside of these institutions and thinking about some of the stuff we've talked about tonight about um, people doing science that, that doesn't look to us like science or that we haven't decided yet is science. Um, mm. That's a much more expansive way to look at this. Um, and as far as Jocelyn Bell Burnell is concerned, like she's doing fine. <laughs> she doesn't feel she's right all right. Her. She's good. <laughs> yeah. and she she is. understands the structural reasons that she wasn't awarded that prize. And you can, she's written a lot about it. You can read about it. And she understands also that like being a woman in science is really difficult. And she's written about her experiences doing that. And I think people who are interested in that story would be really well served by reading what about her actual experiences um, as opposed to just saying like oh well she was snubbed for it because she was a woman i yeah. that's probably true but there was more to it yeah yeah i think another example of that as well is lise meitner who people are often say that she was snubbed um for the nobel prize for discovering nuclear nu nuclear nuclear vision and um, which led to obviously the the atom bomb and all of that um, and that she was snubbed because she was woman which is partly true but also she was Jewish and boiling it down to she was just denied because she was a woman really erases that part of her and the part the specific oppressions that she as a Jewish woman experienced mm -hmm. Um, so again, like Anna said, just kind of looking at the, the structural experiences of women and not just, you know, did they get the prize or not? Mm, okay. I, I think that um, sometimes we, we do that because we live in a bit of a soundbite mm -hmm. Twitter culture. 
Sure. And that that first sound bite, ah, you want to run with that. It's like, well, maybe there's some more nuance there. There's some more information there. Mm-hmm. And thank you for that um, reminder to do that. We are we are right up at the hour. Um, but I want to ask, and I, did I lose the question here? We we talked really briefly about hidden figures, but are there other um, films perhaps about women scientists that you that you know of or would recommend or I I, I um, this is a weird story but I go to Dragon Con every year and the first year I went I cosplayed as Hypatia someone asked they had the costume they said will you participate in the parade and dress as Hypatia and I said sure and I have never had more random conversations with people in my life who came up to tell me about her and told me about the movie that I had not seen prior to cosplaying as her. And I was fascinated um, by that story. But yeah, no, I'm babbling on, but can't, uh, are there films or any, or that you guys can recommend? Because um, sometimes we get people through um, visual before we get them to the books. Um, you know, there's really not a whole lot about women in yeah. science. Like Mar- we, we're jo- we've been joking about Marie Curie, but she just got a biopic last year. What? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it was on Amazon. Like it wasn't even like a, like a theatrical, a theatrically planned release. It was a streaming service film, which is, I watch those all the time, especially now. Right. But yes. like, so not to diminish that, I don't want to get into a conversation about cinema, but, um, but yeah, I mean, she's the one that everybody knows about the most famous one. And she just got a biopic, which actually was good okay (laughs) I I, I thought that was really good um and really well done um but aside from hidden figures I mean there's still just a lot of these films where women are kind of the side piece like in um the Alan Turing movie um you know he's got his uh wife assistant or girlfriend assistant I can't remember her name and then there was another one I was thinking about that just I just looked up called The Dig on Netflix which I actually really liked um, but, um, it's about, um, the uncovering of Sutton Hoo, uh, the big, the, the, like most enormous, like Anglo-Saxon archeological discovery that we've still, I think ever found. And, um, it was kind of a amateur scientist man who was, who was in charge of it, but, um, it was like a woman who funded it and there were other women on the site who were archeologists. Um, and she kind of turns into like a love interest type of deal side piece. Um, and so, I mean, I think there are some where we just still need more work to do. And in that case, like it's kind of extraordinary that hidden figures was made with the actress actors that it had with the money and budget that it had, I mean, that was really incredible that that happened, but it needs right. to happen more. Well, the success of that, sort of like with Black Panther, I hope gets people to go, huh, there, there, there's more room here. We need there, you know, look at all these people that we can exploit and make money from. What? I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> but, you know, but no, but tell those stories. Those stories can uh, be brought to pop culture um, and both earn and thrive um, in public space. Um, but I want to I wanna thank you both so much um, for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Thank you uh, for the book. And uh, folks, if you are uh, watching, you haven't gotten the book yet. It is available everywhere. And I, you know what? I know what you said, Anna, but I'm hoping folks get this before it goes to the bargain bin. <laughs> 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 I know, I know you were like initially joking and then, Hey, maybe not, but you know, yeah, you know, get this, put it on your coffee table, um, your bookshelf, you know, and, you know, for, um, I would say for folks in your life to flip through, but for you to flip through, um, and, and see some of these stories and go, what? I didn't know that. <laughs> um, which I, I think is a, is a good thing. Um, but everyone, I, um, I do want to, uh, I remind you that if you missed anything of our discussion, it, it will be available tomorrow, uh, skepticalinquirer.org. And uh, please join us for the next uh, Skeptical Inquirer Presents. That's on October 14th. And we welcome Lee McIntyre, who will tell us how to talk to a science denier, because uh, we've <laughs> had those conversations. We want to do them better. Uh, my thanks to Skeptical Inquirer. 
uh, the Center for Inquiry, uh, our producer, Mark Kreidler, and to you, the audience, for sharing your time with us today. Um, my name is Leanne Ward, your host. Thank you, and good night. Uh, Leela, Anna, you guys are the best. Thanks for the Thank great you. combo. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye.